Hello and welcome to session 3BJ of uh, GC UK 2021. Um, this session will be given uh, by Chris Taylor from the 21st Century Software Organization. Um, Butch was on the, uh, I was going to say menu, he was, on the, <laughs> he was on the list of speakers for today, but uh, unfortunately he's not going to be with us. So. Uh, the session is, like I said before, 3BJ, you'll need that for your feedback. Uh, and the session is why visibility and surgical recovery is needed for true cyber resiliency. To show your appreciation of the, uh, all the effort that's been uh, put into the conference, especially by the speakers uh, and uh, creating their presentations and so on, please uh, show your appreciation by digging deep and uh, sponsor, uh, sponsoring, supporting our uh, charities this year, the RNLI and the uh, Bad Dogs for the Blind, very worthy uh, and necessary charities. And you may be rewarded for your generosity uh, as you will get a raffle ticket for the uh, for the raffle <laughs> and uh, my uh, good luck to you uh, in the fact that you might just be rewarded. Uh, so now I'll give over to Chris and uh, let him take the session. Thanks very much Anna. Um, as you can see the uh, Butch Rambish's name is on here. He's deserted me in favour of uh, going to a Dodgers baseball camp, whatever that is. So uh, he's normally my partner in crime here. His email is on the, uh, at the, on the last slide as well. If uh, you either want to send emails to any questions, uh, follow-up questions to him, him or, or myself. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to a session that was held in the same time slot a week ago, which was, uh, are you truly optimizing resiliency on IBM Z? With, um, with the whole question of resiliency, uh, IZBR, which is what I'm, I'm going to be focusing on today, does do a lot of different tasks uh, around resiliency. Um, we're going to be focusing largely on the Cyber Vault and Safeguarded Copy Solution today to talk a little bit more about that. But uh, if you want to go back and look at some of the other features that are available in IZBR, then uh, please go and listen to the recording from the session last week. So, as far as resiliency goes, without tooling, um, and, and a lot of companies have gone through this kind of uh, exercise. And unfortunately, it's not something that's controlled. It, uh, it happens unexpectedly. That's uh, kind of the nature of the beast. And um, what we're trying to demonstrate here is to show you some of the things that you need to take into consideration if you're performing resiliency without any form of tooling. So, you know, you then need to call out the applications and you, you, you then start to get uh, into what they call a war room which is basically where everybody huddles, everybody speaks very loudly, everybody, um, you know, basically tries to work out how to do this. And then, you know, they need to work out exactly what do they need to recover, what other applications are affected. Then, okay, let's go out and find the JCL where that might be. Uh, you know, how, where do I find the JCL to actually recreate a data set maybe? These are all the kind of things, that, oh, I can't find the backups that I'm looking for. Let's go and find out if HSM, for example, has a backup. Or in our case, we're going to then look into how we can use uh, Cyber Vault or, or safeguarded copy backups for this, for this thing. Then go through it again and hope that you have run it correctly. And what I mean by that is, is basically, um, you know, we've, we've heard of cases where customers have gone through the complete process again, only to find that not the correct uh, data was recovered. So they have to go through it again. And in some cases, and the, the, the example that we heard from one of the customers was the fact that they had to then actually bring extra engines online to their, to their Z machine because, because they had to run uh, multiple cycles, batch cycles in a single day. They had to run their regular batch cycle as well as go back into the past uh, you know, and, and run the, the one from the previous two days. So they had to bring extra engines online, which of course costs more money. And, and, and hopefully you get the right data so that you can... Uh, get back online as quickly as possible. Time is the enemy. You know, the difference between an, uh, an incident and a, a catastrophe is time. You know, since if it's only, a, if something only happens for a couple of minutes, then you, it may be just a blip on the radar. 
But if something takes hours, then that's something that possibly the whole world is going to hear about via Twitter and things like that. So that's why this poor person is sitting here with their bottle of aspirin on their desk because they've got a significant headache because it's taking them a long time to go and get all of this information together. Now, um, IBM Z Batch Resiliency is, um, is, a, is a product uh, that, that uh, provides a lot of the information through analytics in order to be able to provide resiliency. So uh, we have everything is derived from the application table. Uh, we have a real time, uh, we have an extractor which extracts the relevant uh, SMF records that are required for the product. And this then gets fed into a uh, piece called RTSMF, which I'll, I'll go a little bit more into later on. Uh, the core is an inventory data set which contains you know, the accesses to particular data sets, which applications they belong to. And uh, this is derived from the application table, which we uh, build from the job scheduling system. From that, we can get a lot of reports out regarding the inventory itself, as well as we also have another database for one of a better word called the backup table. In the backup table, that's where the backups for the regular application backups are stored, regardless of whether, for example, they were taken using DSS, whether they were using CA disk, whether they're using it cams, um, pretty much um, even, even homegrown um, backup methodologies will be supported. Um, over on the right here of your screen, you can see our timeline component. This is actually a feature that is running alongside and is monitoring all the opens and closes of, of data sets. So now it's not doing this via the SMF extractor, it's doing it in real time. Um, it does still use the application table to determine which data sets does it want to monitor. And from there, again, we can, we can actually look at instantly and see what, what data sets were affected. We can see, for example, we feed this into what we call our cascade reports, which I'll uh, do a quick demo on later. Um, and we, we have a forward and a reverse cascade report. The forward will show us which data sets were affected downstream from the original job and the reverse cascade will go backwards in time and that, especially when we're talking about a cyber vault solution, will allow us to determine some of the things that we need to know for forensic analysis, what maybe what led to a particular situation happening in the first place. Um, from there, we also, and I'll, and I'll show that a copy of that later on, we have something called the cyber vault health check report. And that actually shows us, for example, in the event of a catastrophic outage, it would show us which data sets were actually open for output, because generally in the catastrophic out, uh, outage, we would be uh, doing a complete recovery, maybe from a safeguarded copy, rather than just a, a surgical recovery of individual data sets. So that can show us where we need to pay more attention to the particular data sets that are being recovered. This is all done for using panels. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick, also do a quick demo of that to show, um, you know, to show how that's, that's performed as well. As I mentioned, the, the core of where the, the analytics is performed is derived from the application table or the app table. Um, every, uh, pretty much every common uh, job scheduling system is supported. Um, you know, IZWS is, is supported. And in fact, we have extra support in there for being able to do what we call dynamic uh, additions. In other words, any ad hoc uh, requests that come in throughout the day would be added, can be added automatically to the to the application table and then be monitored for the you know for what uh, data sets they affect. With the, most of the other uh, job schedulers at the moment, it's uh, generally a once a day type job that gets run. And this feeds then into builds the application table that generally on a daily basis, we run this. And then that would be the information we use to determine which um, data sets um, to monitor and um, which part of the applications they belong to as well as also seeing where, which applications we belong to. Uh, I'll also show a report, which will show us things that run outside of the scheduling system, because those, especially when we come to things like um, ransomware and things like that, we may want to be made aware of uh, jobs that are running outside the scheduling system, because they could be uh, trying to do some nefarious purpose against data sets. So we want to be informed about those as well. The, 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 the foundation for the analytics is uh, um, a feature called RTSMF. Um, again, using the application table, we then pass it to various subtasks within 
um, RTSMF. So it's a very, very efficient process. Uh, the, uh, we, this is where the inventory is taken. The history audit is actually, the audit is, is of things that are not running as part of the application. So we do monitor all, all the various activities against the data sets and then report on those if they're not running within the scheduler, uh, the scheduler through the scheduler itself. The backup table is also then kept in, in via the SMF records. And then we also have a couple of other features um, like the, the real-time scheduler, which is a, is a way of scheduling backups to be taken at various points throughout the day. We also have a recovery simulator. This was covered last week. Uh, we have a, a ZFS um, ability to monitor those and recover those type of data sets. And then if we look towards the bottom there, we have something we, we call the 3D virtual catalog. And this is our latest feature, which came out in release two of uh, IZBR. And from that, that is actually going to be the foundation of how we perform uh, recoveries from safeguarded copies, either in or outside of the cyber vault. Um, last but not least, I also mentioned our timeliner feature there. This is uh, where we track uh, you know, jobs and data set usage while they're actually running through the use of SVCs within the operating system. Now, we consider that, um, that uh, safeguarded copies in general is probably uh, something that is used, very, very useful to have, obviously, but it's also really a backup of last resort. Uh, in other words, um, we don't really want to have to use those copies unless we really have to. I mean, there's, there's uh, some, some things and I'll kind of demonstrate how that works. The, you know, the, the safeguarded copy is being taken by the IBM hardware, by the DS8000 hardware, as it actually happens. Um, we don't know the state of the data sets as they're actually happening, whether they're uh, open or closed. So those are the kind of things that are also being monitored by IZBR, and we can report on those open data sets as well. So it's still important to be able to cover your regular resiliency, which is using um, you know, your standard, for example, uh, DFDSS or um, ADR DSSU, sometimes as it's known as, and whether you're using IB Genus sorts, CA disk, various HSM functions. Um, we also can report on DB2 and IMS image copy logs as they're taking place. We don't necessarily offer a recovery scenario. There's other tools to be able to do that within the IBM portfolio. And then off to the right here, what you can see is you can see that uh, safeguarded copies are being monitored through use of what we call the 3D virtual catalog in IZBR. And I'll kind of demonstrate that a little bit in a minute. As I mentioned, we have our timeliner feature. Unfortunately, my animated um, chart I noticed yesterday is, uh, is not working as animated as it should. In other words, it's not working at all. But basically, that line that you see off to the right-hand side, that dotted line should go back to somewhere in the middle to show when the corruption occurred. And from there, we can derive what other jobs and data sets were affected by, um, by, uh, by maybe you know, some either, either something going wrong with a job or, or some kind of ab end. And uh, that would then allow us to be able to determine which jobs should be rerun rather than having to say, you know, run the whole set, the whole suite of jobs. We can see which data sets are affected, which data sets might need to be recovered. Also, we, you know, and as I say, just basically only run the jobs that are necessary to be able to, you know, to get a more complete situation. Um, Anna, I'm assuming there's no questions at the, at the moment. Otherwise, I will continue. <laughs> okay. So, why IBM Z Cyber Vault? Now, this is something that it, that uh, you may be aware of through through your IBM contacts here. But uh, there's been a large spike in in ransomware attacks and and the like. And and I think a lot of us have that impression that um, you know there, somebody somebody who's a hacker might just be sitting in a you know in their cellar somewhere at home. And basically, you know, they're wearing their hooded sweatshirt type thing. And, uh, you know, this, this is basically, you know, something that they do as a hobby, as it were. It's way, way beyond that now. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, in this, in this chart, we talk about ransomware as a service. So this is actually a very, very big business now. And um, even though people are being discouraged from making the payments, you know, when, when let's say that when they have ransomware in, in play, but um, you know, inevitably, that's sometimes the quickest way to deal with it. 
unfortunately encourages people to do this kind of thing. And it, and it is a very, very lucrative business. Now, the example that we use is Kaseya. Um, this is uh, something that you know hit a, hit a, hit a, a while back and, and, and affected very much the um, you know 800 co-op stores in, in Sweden. Um, and this this came through, um, you know, like an S SQL in, in, injection. And those are the kind of things that you know you need to be aware of. You know, we we said for a long time that the IBM Z platform is immune from those kind of things. But you know, with the with the prevalence nowadays of, of USS type services and, and different uh, ports being opened up, and you know, that is a way. And FTPs, for example, coming in from other uh, outside of the of the IB, IBM Z ecosystem, there's also other opportunity to introduce files there that could be affected by ransomware. So those are all the kind of things that um, one needs to be aware of. I was reading earlier on this week that uh, there's been a, um, there's been some success in trying to track down the people who performed this attack. And you know, Revel, I, I think they've uh, they've got some of their money back. The authorities, as well as some people, were arrested um, in, in various parts of the world. But this is the kind of thing here, where I mean, we're talking here about something that came in from external. But you also need to be aware of potential ransomware attacks and things that might happen internally within the environment. And that could be either done by you know one person um, or it could be done by a group of people. And those are the kind of things that we need to protect ourselves from when we're considering resiliency as a whole. So this is uh, one of the charts that we use is uh, how to describe CyberVault is, is basically cyber, you know, the, the hardware knows the, that they, that I've backed up pretty much in, you know, it could be the whole storage array. So where can I find an individual file that I'm looking for? Where can I find an individual data set that I need? So, you know, my holiday photograph, I, I want to take a picture of Gold Hill. Where is it in my, in my complete arsenal here of, um, of, of, of photographs that I might have in, in, I don't know, on my iPhone, I've got, you know, a thousand, two thousand photographs. So where can I find one particular photo that where it is without having to go search through each one individually. And that's kind of what is akin to the cyber vault solution. The hardware sees it as a, as a, as a, you know, just a snapshot as it were of what was active in the environment at the time. It, it, it's very, very fast. And, uh, but it could in, in, in contain millions of data sets. So how can I find that particular data set that I'm looking for, as well as also making sure that the, that the, the, the backup that was taken that it was taken with as much integrity as possible. If the data set's open, then it's considered a fuzzy backup. I might be able to go back and see if I can find another version of that data set where it, it, it wasn't a fuzzy backup as it were. So the IBM Z CyberVault solution, we've kind of seen a, a little a chart a little bit like this before. We offer a, you know, for, for a complete, what we call a catastrophic recovery, IZBR offers um, uh, the CyberVault health check report so that um, we are focusing here on non-database managed data. In other words, generally, you know, the DB2, IMS, those kind of systems will take care of themselves. But we're really looking out for the other, you know, the, the other hidden heroes here, which is things like, uh, the, you know, the vSAM data sets, as well as the sequential files or non-database managed data that is open for output here. Using a combination of that, as well as the timeline, uh, you know, reverse cascade and forward cascade reports, we can start to do some forensic investigation as to maybe where the source of the corruption occurred or how we affect that. The reverse cascade is used more actually to find source, and you can do this within the cyber vault and, and then actually to, you know try to find out exactly maybe where the malfeasance occurred in the first place to lead you to this. It may not be a ransomware attack. It might just be an application outage, but sometimes you need to determine, is it you know what is it before we can continue and try to, to try to uh, repair the damage and this is all that can be done in the cyber vault which would then be completely disconnected from the production environment you know see which of these data sets are, are critical make sure that we they can be recovered and then do that in a simple manner via an ispf interface and as i mentioned here the forward cascade report will then be can then be used to develop a forward recovery plan to um, you know, to continue running the business. We generally talk here about these are the stages within what can be performed within the cyber vault. So data validation, those are kind of things that happen on a regular basis 
with the application so that they can make sure that they're recoverable. That's not something that you always you do immediately at the catastrophe time. You do that ahead of time to make sure that you have a solution where you can do recovery from. Where IZBL comes into the into play is the ability to help with the forensic analysis by knowing which data sets could be affected and which data sets were touched by various jobs. And then also to be able to do the surgical recovery, that's the individual data set recovery rather than the catastrophic recovery. If you do the catastrophic recovery, then we can use the CyberVault health check report to show which data sets were, um, were open for output at the time so that we can do a more targeted or surgical recovery. So IZBR complements the, uh, the IBM CyberVault health uh, CyberVault solution. So some of the use cases, the way you could use the, the, the CyberVault would be to, to recover any data set from a safeguarded copy. It doesn't matter if it's VSAM, non-VSAM, um, you know, generally we're non-database managed data at this at this particular point right now. But also, you know, it could be a, a software upgrade fail. That, that again, this this would be somewhere where we would use, um, regard this as something of last resort. Any disruption that is caused by a ransomware attack or any other kind of uh, thing that, call, that that can cause an outage. That's where the, the, the cyber vault and the safeguarded copies can be used to affect the recovery. I'm going to go into more detail on this um, in, in the demo in a second, but uh, here the 3D virtual catalog is the basis. It's a patent pending solution uh, from, that we use within IZBR to be able to show lists of data sets and how they were used, whether they were open, for example, um, the history of the data sets as well. Where did the data set reside? And I'll try and show that a little bit in a minute. And then from there, we can actually then look at the individual records and say, OK, give me the, uh, the you know, allow me the ability to recover those data sets individually or as a group of data sets. So let's see if I can switch over to the demo here. Um, Anna, can you confirm that you're seeing a 3270 screen now? I most certainly am. Good, excellent, good. In fact, uh, that's probably not where I wanted to go. Yes, it is actually, and then I'll go back to a different one. But uh, kind of a little bit of a recap of what uh, what we talked about and what we also talked about in our presentation last week is that everything that we have is derived from the application table. So in this case, this is a demo environment in our, in our lab in, in Perth in Australia. So we have kind of like a, a, a few applications that run on a daily basis so that we can just kind of demo uh, the solution. So here, this is actually the application table within IZBR derived from um, IZWS in our case. And uh, we can see, for example, which is the first job in, in the schedule. And then it shows us all the jobs in the schedule all the way down to the end. And those would then be what would be monitored, A, by the analytics for IZBR as well as the, um, the timeline of feature of IZBR. So those are the kind of things we have. And then, as I said, as I showed last week, we have also an ad hoc feature where we could then add jobs uh, via the via, via IZWS so that they would be picked up immediately. Now the core, as I mentioned with it for the analytics within IZBR is to actually go and uh, look at the application, uh, the inventory itself rather. And in here, I'm gonna pick up one of our applications that we saw just now. And uh, from here, this will show me um, the uh, the inventory on how the data sets were accessed within a particular production cycle. I can sort it then. Um, I talked last week about the you know the differences between the ver various status of data sets, critical data sets, uh, the status of one and two are critical and exception. Then we have the deletions, which are three, and then four is uh, a data sets that are created as part of the application cycle. So this is all information that's important for the analytics. Um, to, to be able to demonstrate uh, and, and show how data sets are being used. Now, one of the other things we have is we have a lot of reporting within IZBR. And, you know, the first stage may be here for, for identifying where malfeasance might be, you know, where there's cause for concern, is we have something called the audit check report. Now, in the audit check report, this is going to show me accesses to data sets that are running outside of the scheduler and they're not being listed in the application table. As mentioned, the application table is largely in most shops derived from the scheduling system. So this is gonna show me um, where somebody might be trying to perform something against the data set. For example, here, I'm gonna show one of them and, um, and show that uh, actually this person who happens to be my user ID, 
on the system, updated this data set outside of the scheduler. You know, my user ID isn't in the scheduler itself. So this will then be targeted. Again, this, this may or may not be a problem, but this could be the first step where we could start to look and see how data it, uh, may be being uh, utilized, how it may be being accessed from outside of the scheduling system itself. And those are things that could be, you know, where uh, either either after the fact, hopefully we'd be able to catch some of this ahead of time where somebody might be doing some practice runs as it were, but uh, that's where where we could use this to, uh, to, 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 to start uh, doing some of our forensic analysis. Now for, you know, we, we've, I've stated that, uh, that the cyber vault really, we, we regard this a little bit as a, as a last resort type uh, process. So but we, what we can also do is just quickly to recap that we also maintain in our backup table, a list of, of, of other backups that are taking part in the system. We can monitor on a, on a um, using some of the technology within IZBR, individual data sets that are being stored within DSS. And we can then affect the recovery from those particular data sets and, where, and their backup locations. So to do that, I'm not going to go through the complete process again, but I would do an R here and then it would pull up and I could then create TSS JCL in order to be able to affect the recovery. Again, this is part of the base resiliency process rather than the, um, than the uh, cyber vault itself. Now within, from there also, we, we have extensive reporting capabilities to make sure backups are being taken. And uh, so we would say here, for example, we find that some of the backup data sets are missing. That also is being tracked so we can make sure um, that, that, that you have sufficient backups on from the applications, making sure they're not missing their backups. And then we also have a complete list of these data sets that could be sent out just to make, you know, because that's probably easier to read than going through potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of data sets in your backup table. Now, the, uh, we also monitor duplicate backups but that would be something that's uh, not really part of this uh, discussion. Okay, let me see if I can switch over here to something else that I wanted to show. So we have, um, this is now going specifically into safeguarded copies and how they would um, normally be recovered if you didn't have IZBR in play here. So I'm, what I'm logged on to on our, on our DS8000 is, our, is the copy services manager interface. Um, this, is, uh, this is a first for me demonstrating this. So bear with me on this because uh, this is not something that I'm an expert at, but we'll see how we get. And I'll, I'll try and show you how a customer would do a recovery without having IZBR in play. So from, for, the, for the safeguarded copies, we have three different sessions that I'm using. We have one that does a backup every 30 minutes. In other words, in the background, um, unbeknownst to the operating system, unbeknownst to ZOS, a backup is taking place every 30 minutes. We also have some other volumes that are being covered every 60 minutes. And then we have a, finally, we have a, a set of volumes that are being done every, every uh, six hours. So if I click on this particular instance, this is the one that I'm gonna be demonstrating from today. This is the 30 minute one. And then we're presented with uh, some actions uh, underneath here. I can actually look at the copy set as it's called, and it will show me which volumes are being um, monitored here. So these are the primary volumes. So in other words, data sets that are, reside on this volume are being backed up every 30 minutes. Um, and this is this E$CV01 through four. Now, when this gets defined within copy services manager one also needs to then um, uh, define recovery volumes and th these would be volumes where when the recovery takes place they would be recovered to these volumes and there's a one-to-one -one relationship uh, they can be space efficient in other words it doesn't have to always be a full capacity but uh, that's more something specific to the DS8000 where you can then say, okay, I'm only gonna really use the space that I really need to use on this. So if I go back to the previous set here, uh, what before I do that, I'm gonna hotkey back over to my uh, ISPF session and I'm gonna show you what the, vo what the recovery volume looks like now. So as I mentioned, we have E$CV01 and here I'm gonna show you what's, uh, 
what's on, uh, well, actually I can show you CV01 first, and you can see there's a group of data sets. Now these are being backed up and being put into safeguarded copies and would be available then for the cyber vault. Now, if we look at the recovery volume right now, there is nothing on there because it's uh, basically waiting for, for input as it were. Now in the background here, what I can do from, um, from the copy services manager, and this is what, how you would do a normal recovery, is I can then look at all the copy sets that are available. I can select one of them and I can say, effect the recovery. So what's happening here is you can see it's running at the moment. And then when this completes, this is, this is now taking place on the DS8000. When it completes, it, it's uh, now uh, available. Now, if I go back into 3.4 and look at the recovery volume, you'll now see there's data sets on the recovery volume. Now, if you also look down, if you're familiar with things like VTOX and also with uh, VVDS data sets that uh, contain VSAM volume information, you'll see here now that even though I'm on RV01, it actually says CV01. It is now looks like the original volume now, but the data sets that are on these volumes are not cataloged to this volume. They're cataloged to the original volume. So any other activity that you would need to take place after this would need to be done, performed by the user or you know, by, by the customer to be able to then reconstruct the data sets, for example, recatalog them. In the case of data, uh, vSAM data sets, make sure you recatalog the components correctly. That would all be something that would need to be done manually. So this is generally what you would use more for a catastrophic recovery as it were, because the, um, because this was, you'd also have your catalogs alongside that. So that would be something then when everything would line up and, and would be used for catastrophic recovery. And then you would then use certain pieces just to, um, you know, to, to fix individual data sets. I'm now gonna terminate that relationship here within, um, within uh, safeguarded copies. So when this is finished and we go back onto that RV01 volume, it's now gone back to what it looked like before. It's, it's not a permanent implementation. But one of the other things that I should have pointed out here is, is that all of those four volumes, when I do that, would have been recovered as well. In fact, let's do it because it's fairly quickly. But uh, all four volumes here, when I do a recovery of a particular backup, all, all the volumes in, a, in, in that particular copy set would be recovered at the same time. So as well as RV01 or CV01 that, that, that was being recovered, we then also be able to uh, recover all the other volumes and that's not a choice. So if you have a copy set that has a thousand volumes in it, all of those volumes are gonna be recovered within the DS8K. So that's an example there of, of, of how other volumes, even though I'm really interested, let's say in data sets on one of those volumes, this is actually um, you know, recovering everything. Now, how can we make things easier there using IZBR? So from within the IZBR interface, I'm gonna drill down to our, if I get the right screen up here, I'm gonna drill down to using our safeguarded copy option number 12 here. And this would be the first instance of how we look at the uh, 3D virtual catalog. So from in here, um, it, it's a 3.4 like, um, Syntax, in other words, you know, uh, you're using your standard syntax that you would use in 3.4. And from here, what I can see is I can then drill down a little bit more and I can look at the uh, data sets where they, where they maybe resided before. Now, unfortunately, uh, something's just rolled off here. So all our history is gone. That happened more than 14 days ago. But under normal circumstances here, I could look at the history and see where a data set may have resided in the past. For example, um, until this morning, what happened is the data sets were residing on a different volume. I moved them about two weeks ago, and then I'd be able to see the history of those so that we could say, you know what, do I wanna take the version that was created on this volume or do I wanna go back to a previous version? Now, if I uh, close these out again, what I'm then gonna do is I'm gonna try and recover these three data sets or see what the state of these data sets is within the, within the safeguarded copy. So this is actually a, a call using the a command line interface from within Copy Services Manager. This is actually logging onto the server, which we actually have running on a Linux. 
box, but generally would reside on the DS8000 itself. It's going to provide me the information on the copy set uh, that were taken on the system, and then it's going to give me the, the results of those. Now, if we look over here, these are some backups that have taken place um, this morning. This is in this is in Perth, Australia, so uh, they're already ahead of us time-wise. Um, so we can see here these are half hourly intervals, and we we can also look and see that some of these data sets within these copy sets, some of the data sets that I've selected were open. So these might be the particular. We don't necessarily want to take those. Um, for our recovery point, because we'd like to try and get as clean a recovery as possible. So in this particular case, all three data sets were open that I want to recover. Um, if we look at one of these other ones, I think we'll see only two of those data sets. So I might be able to recover in one of those individual data sets. So the, uh, this sequential file was closed at that particular time, but this VSAM data set and this other sequential file were, were open as well. So what I'm what I will do in this particular case is I'll say okay I'll go to the previous one before that I want to go back to 21:30 uh, yesterday evening in in, in in Perth. So from here what I can do is I'll supply a staging volume. Now a staging volume is where I am going to put the version of a data set that can be used um, you know for forensic analysis. And generally, what we'll do is, is um, as you saw in the cyber vault, it will go back to a recovery volume. What we're going to do in this case is we're going to recover the data sets with a new name so that we can perform forensic analysis. You know, where this resides, whether it resides in the cyber vault, which is air gapped and disconnected from the primary site, or whether this is available to the production system, that is entirely up to the user how they want to do that. So, what I'm going to do here is I change the data sets names, I supply a change, uh, uh, staging volume, and then it's gonna generate a, a job for me to submit. And what we will do then is submit this. And in the background, it is going through some of the same activities that we saw when, um, when, we, were when we were doing the uh, recovery from the cyber vault using our IBM Coffee Services Manager. Now, if you look at this, if you were to look at this RV volume again, it would be empty because basically what we've done under the covers is to actually affect any recovery necessary and then release the volumes again. But from here, we can see, um, well, if I did, if I type it right, we could see, we should be able to see, uh, what did I do here? I must have uh, given the wrong name. Um, Chris T.test, okay, what happened there? Oh, I know what happened there, I think. Do I? Nope, not quite sure what I did here, but uh, the data set should be recovered and I can't find them anymore. Okay, well, that's useful. That's the demo effect, I'm afraid, but um, the uh, data set should be recovered and um, would be available normally to for us to be able to view. And uh, let's have a look at BR. Oh, I got an eight. Uh, something else went wrong with it during this process. That's why. Nope, oh, says recovery is already active. So I, I think maybe um, something went wrong when I didn't release it correctly from when we did the cyber vault. So yeah, that might be a problem there. That's uh, something caused by the uh, by this previous activity I did here. I terminated it, but it seems like it didn't terminate it correctly. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. I'll have to investigate that after the fact. But if things gone according to plan, then basically the data set would have been recovered um, and we would be able to then process it as normal. And that would have been both, both a combination of um, VSAM and non-VSAM. Um, one more thing I'd like to, reco uh, to cover is the, um, we'll look at uh, the DS, uh, the Subavolt Health Check Report here. So from, from this one, um, this is what we, you would use in the case of catastrophic uh, recovery, as it were. The, um, the, this would show me all the open data sets at, at a particular time. So what I chose here from, from last night's run is I chose um, at 11.03.18, for one second, I said, show me everything that was being processed at that time. That would be typically an interval that, might, uh, you know, that I would select for, for, from when a safeguarded copy might have been taken. So this will show me all data sets that were open for output. 
Um, and um, this would then be data sets that I would, if, if I was doing a complete recovery um, from, from in, a, in a catastrophic outage situation, I would then um, use that to, uh, to determine where I might have to do extra activity. For example, with some of these, these testing note reports, I might have to take, go back to either a different backup or go back to, a, to an earlier backup or a later backup, depending on, on what was available. Um, in closing, I think what I'd, uh, I'm gonna show just one more thing to do with the timeline. I, I kind, of, kind of showed this a little bit last week, but um, we'll, we'll go through it again and see how we can then use Timeliner to uh, to look a little bit further into the, um, you know, what might be affected either downstream or, you know, what might have led up to a problem in the first place. So, you know, from trying to do forensic analysis to see what's happened um, previously, what we would do here is that we would go back in time to see what led to a particular um, outage. Uh, if we assume here that the job I'm looking at, INSCT004, is, um, is, is, is where the problem occurred. And looking backwards, we can see here that this was touched by various data sets. And including here at the bottom here, we have an FTP process that actually put this into the system. So this was the output data set that was created. And from there, it uh, then created this data set, which is actually part of the application itself. So we have now seen here that this might be the cause of where something was introduced into the system that shouldn't be. So that's how we would do something going, going using the reverse cascade report, because it basically is working backwards, you know, from backwards in time. As you can see here, you know, these jobs run about 10.53, and then some of the application jobs actually run like 11 o'clock or, or 11.03. When the, when the main application ran. So that would give us some more idea about um, you know, where to look and see if there's any problems that were caused by that process. Um, if we then determine that other things need to, to be worked on further downstream, then what we would do is we would do use the forward cascade report for that. So this is now going from INSCT 004 forward in time, and then seeing other jobs that were affected by it in other words, we're still using some jobs here within the INSCT application, but then we can also see here that another application, the DDA application, is um, is also affected by by some of these um, by by this input. So those would be the kind of things that we would then need to further determine what would need to be rerun in order to to make sure that things are brought up to speed. I think that's everything that I wanted to show today. I know it's a little bit early, but um, I think it's the last session pretty much of the conference. So I want to give a little bit of time back. Um, I don't know sure what, uh, if there's any questions at all. Um, there are no questions in the chat, but I will uh, allow people to unmute themselves. So if you do want to talk to Chris, um, you may unmute yourself and do so. Um, yeah, after this, there is only the wrap up session. Okay, then I'm just showing a couple of the resources and things like that to where people can go to the, the, the slides are uploaded. So there are some uh, places that they can go to to get more information and um, also as a, a butch and, and my emails are on the on this last slide as well. So if they want to uh, you know, if they want to uh, contact us directly. Okay, so no one's taking advantage of the fact that they can unmute themselves nor uh, writing in the chat. So um, I will just go on to remind you to submit your session feedback. This was session 3BJ. Um, when you're answering the questions um, about the uh, session, the feedback session, uh, note that one of the questions uh, looks like it might be number two. Uh, was the length of the presentation correct? Five would be the correct answer. One means it was too short. Nine means it was too long. Okay, so <laughs> we get a lot of nines on that particular question. Um, quite, quite obviously, uh, just not having read the scoring system. 
So please be careful with that question. Um, also, uh, the charities, dig deep. This is your pretty much your final opportunity to thank everybody uh, involved in the conference, especially the speakers, by donating generously to our charities, uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind and Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Uh, both of which are uh, performing essential tasks um, as charities. Uh, you may also think about becoming a member of the GSE. If your company is not already a member of the GSE, then uh, you could see whether they are uh, interested in becoming members. There are obviously some benefits to that. Um, so uh, you can look into that. Uh, you can find out a lot on the GSC website, uh, and we already, uh, sorry, we also have uh, quite, quite newly <laughs> individual membership. So if your company doesn't like to be a member, you can be a member yourself. Um, okay, uh, I don't think there's anything else to cover, so... Just thanks to everybody for attending. Thanks to Chris for presenting. Uh, uh, good luck to Butch on his uh, baseball camp. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, but, but on that point, I guess, uh, good night and goodbye to you all and uh, hopefully see you next year. <laughs>